Organic Chemistry, Chem 212, Exam 1 Material, Part 4. Properties of Alkanes. The first four alkanes, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, are gases at room temperature. Alkanes with 5 to 15 carbons are liquids at room temperature. And alkanes with 16 or more carbons are gases with low melting points. Alkanes are odorless, colorless, and tasteless. So you might be thinking, I can smell when gas is leaking at your home, like the methane or the propane gas is leaking. That's because they add an impurity, and typically that impurity is a sulfur-based, and what that is, it's an assault to our senses, and so it alerts us and we know that something's wrong. Nonpolar alkanes are insoluble in water, but soluble in nonpolar solvents. That goes back to that like dissolves like idea we've seen before, where polar dissolves polar, and nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. Alkanes are less dense than water, they're also flammable, and we get an increase in melting and boiling point with increase in molecular weight. Branching tends to decrease melting point. So that's the basis of a lot of comparisons of melting points and boiling points. If the molecule weighs more than another molecule, it'll have a higher melting point and a higher boiling point than something that weighs less. Branching tends to decrease melting point. Take a look at these graphics I have here. They both are actually isomers of each other. They have the same molecular formula, but a different structure. And this one has the tetrahedral carbon in the middle, where this shape here is more of a sphere where all, all the five atoms, all the five carbon atoms, make kind of a sphere shape. Whereas here, we have straight pentane, or n-pentane, and again, it zigzags. We know that, we still call it a straight chain. But did you notice how it represents the molecules themselves are touching in a lot of places. We have a lot of intermolecular forces and you can see how in pentane they kind of stack up on top of each other. So the intermolecular forces in this kind of a molecule is much higher. That means it takes more energy to get each molecule away from each other versus when we have branching and we can see that we have a three carbon chain with two branches. What's going to happen in that case is you have less intermolecular forces and it takes less energy to keep to remove each molecule from each other. Alkanes have a low reactivity and they're also called paraffins and that comes from their low affinity compounds that they're low reactive and most of these alkanes don't react with other chemicals but they will react with oxygen and some of the halogen so we're going to only see a few reactions with our alkanes but combustion being the most common. We just saw on the previous slide that as we have a molecular weight increase we have boiling points and melting point increases. So we have this graph here showing us that. We have number of carbons and you can see with melting point we do have a little bit coming down here on three carbons but as we start increasing the number of carbons which means the molar mass increases you can see we have a pretty steady increase here of melting points with molecular weight. Taking a look at boiling points, that's in this other color blue here, we can see a very steady increase with boiling points. Any forces we have between these molecules are temporary. They could be the dipoles or the dispersion forces, and they are weak. Reactions of alkanes. So the first reaction we're going to look at, combustion reaction, is also known as an oxidation reaction, and it's also known as burning. All organic compounds can burn. So the reaction I'm showing you here of combustion of alkanes, this is the exact same reaction we're going to see with all organic compounds. So when we get to the double and triple bond compounds, all of them undergo combustion. Let's take a look at methane. CH4, so this is going to be our organic compound we're going to burn. So in all combustion reactions, what's going to happen is our organic compound is going to react with oxygen to form CO2 water, and energy. Most of the time when you're given this reaction it'll probably be up to you to balance the equation. And if you take a look at this I have two examples of balanced equations. What you might want to do is write out these reactions without the coefficient, pa uh, practice balancing them, and check how you did. The first problem, write the balanced combustion reaction of propane. Now when you're doing combustion reactions it's best for you to have the organic compound written in molecular formula. Now this is probably, in fact, it is the only reaction where you're going to use molecular formula. All reactions from here on out 
will be condensed structural formula so we can see where everything goes. Let's go ahead and start this one out. We have propane, C3H, to know how many hydrogen this needs. We use CnH2n plus 2, so 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8, and we're going to react it with oxygen. Let's give ourselves some rooms to put, room to put some coefficients in there. And it always makes CO2, water, and energy. You do need to put energy in all these reactions. We're not going to have any coefficients on here, but we need to indicate that energy is given off because it's a product in our reaction. All right, the easiest way to balance combustion reactions, if you haven't already learned how to do them or if you've forgotten how to do them, that's fine, is to always balance carbon first, hydrogen second, and leave oxygen, which is our diatomic, till last. I have three carbons here. That means I need a three coefficient here. Not only did that change carbon, but it changed oxygen, but remember oxygen is last. Hydrogen, I have eight on the left. They only come in pairs, so I would need a four here. Everything is balanced except for oxygen. Let's take a look. I have a coefficient. Uh, I don't have my coefficient here yet. That's where my last coefficient is going to go. Oxygens only come in pairs. Let's take a look at how many we have on the right. 3 times 2 is 6, plus 4 is 10. I need 10 oxygens on the left hand side to balance the 10 on the right hand side. They only come in pairs, so my coefficient here would be a 5. Be sure to always check your balanced equations. Go back and, and just check your carbons again, your hydrogens and your oxygens. Another thing that we sometimes do with balanced equations is we do a summary of coefficients. It's understood that there's a 1 here and then we have a 5, a 3, and a 4. So sometimes what they do is they'll go ahead and just take all the coefficients in order from left to right and ignoring the reaction arrow and the summary of coefficients would be a 1, 5, 3, and 4. And so sometimes you'll see this as an answer to a multiple choice question instead of them writing out the entire reaction every time with all the subscripts and coefficients, they'll just do a summary of coefficients. So again, it's always reading from left to right, and you have to include one. I know in the reaction it's understood, but on the summary you must put one, and then you go ahead and go from left to right. Write the balanced combustion reaction of butane. All right, carbon, we have C4. H, 4 times 2 is 10, plus 2 is 12. All right, why don't you go ahead and pause the video, write out the combustion reaction, go ahead and balance it. Now, this one is a little bit of a trick in balancing, so if you have a little bit of trouble balancing, when you come back, I go ahead and show you this one. This one is one where the oxygens are odd on one side and even on the other, and I can give you a hint on how to do that if you don't know how to do that already. All right, pause the video and come on back and see how you did. All right, I had made a mistake, so I went ahead and cleaned it up and started over. That's why the previous reaction isn't there anymore. All right, let's take a look here. We want to do carbons first. Four carbons, four carbons. Hydrogens, I have 10. They only come in pairs, so a five goes here. Oxygens, I have four times two, eight plus five, which is 13. So I have 13 on the right-hand side, but they only come pairs on the left-hand side. So here's my hint on how to do that when you have that odd even thing happening. So right now, everything is balanced, carbons and hydrogens. So what you would do is all the coefficients are there, except for don't write anything here yet. Let's leave this one blank. In fact, typically I would tell students, put your finger over the O2 so you don't accidentally double the coefficient there. What you're going to do is double all the coefficients. So the coefficient in front of C4H10 from the butane right now is a 1. It's understood 1. So if I double that, that would be a 2. Don't do this one. CO2 has a 4, that would become an 8. I'm going to double that one, and I'm going to double this one. That still keeps all the carbons and hydrogens balanced since I doubled everything. Now, let's take a look at the oxygens. 8 times 2 is 16. In fact, I'm going to do my math off to the side here so I don't have to keep everything in mind so good. 8 times 2 is 16 plus 10. Oh, I guess that's not so bad. That's 26. I have 26 oxygens on this side I have to show. They only come in pairs. If I take that 26 and divide it by 2, that's 13. So now I have a coefficient. Let's summarize my coefficients. I have a 2, 
a 13, an 8, and a 10. One of the other advantages of summarizing your coefficients is you can also make sure that you have the lowest possible ratio. Remember, that's one of the rules on coefficients on balancing, that the lowest possible ratio must be shown. So I have a 2, 13, 8, and 10, and nope, they all can't be reduced. The next kind of reaction we're going to look at of alkanes is halogenation reactions. And this is a substitution reaction where a halogen is going to substitute where a hydrogen was. This is a reaction between a substance and a halogen in which one or more halogen atoms are incorporated into the molecule of the substance. It's a substitution reaction. Halogenation of an alkane requires the presence of heat or light. So this is something, heat or light, is something you must put over the reaction arrow. Otherwise, the reaction is not going to go. So in this case, it's something that facilitates the reaction. So we'll put that above the arrow. You can use either the words heat or light. Or you can use the symbol, the triangle symbol for heat, or H nu for light. But something must be over the arrow. And this is a halogenation reaction where we have X representing a halogen. Don't forget, halogens are all diatomic. So if I told you this was bromine, it would be Br2. Chlorine would be Cl2. And in this general reaction, we have hydrogen reacting with our halogen in the presence of heat or light. And the two products we're going to get, well, the main product we're going to get is a halogenated alkane. And then we'll get a minor secondary product of HX, a hydrogen halide. The word halogenation is not specific to this one reaction. The word halogen simply means halogen is happening in the reaction. So we're going to see halogenation later on in all other kinds of reactions throughout the, our organic classes. Think of a halogenation reaction. It's not specific to just an alkane. Halogenation just simply means halogen is happening. All right, let's go ahead and try a couple of these problems. It says, write the halogenation reaction of ethane and bromine. So earlier when we did the combustion reaction, I told you that the combustion reaction is easier to write with the molecular formula. From now on, all reactions have to use a condensed structural formula because we need to see exactly where on the molecule things are going. Remember, in a combustion reaction, we're breaking the thing apart. The first problem, write the halogenation reaction of ethane and bromine. And remember, we're using the condensed structural formula. So that would be CH3, CH3. And that's going to react with bromine. So that would be Br2. And over the arrow, I have to choose to show heat or light. So in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and do H nu so we can see another example we had heat up here. And what's going to happen is one of these hydrogens is going to be substituted for one of the bromines. You can use your model kit to demonstrate this. So if you were to go ahead and uh, pause the video, make a ethane, CH3, CH3, and a separate model, model of Br2, what you could do is you can take the Br2 and break it and you're going to see that on these two carbons, there's actually six identical positions where the bromine can go. Because on an ethane, you can twist and flip it, and all six hydrogens are equivalent to each other. So there's only one product possible when we put on one halogen. And also, I need to mention, only one halogen can go on at a time. Never more than one. Always only one halogen at a time. So what's going to happen is, is I will have... One of my carbons will keep all three hydrogens. And then what's going to happen is one of my other carbons is going to give up one of its hydrogens and take that Br in. Now to finish this reaction, we also have, remember the hydrogen that was here? It's going to join one of these bromines, and that's where I'm going to get HBr. So this reaction is finished. Let's take a look at the chlorination reaction of propane. Propane is three carbons, so CH3, CH2, CH3. That's going to react with chlorine, Cl2. And over my arrow here, I'm going to go ahead and do the triangle this time. What's going to happen is on our propane, we actually have different types of hydrogens. So build your model of propane. 
you had ethane already, you're basically going to make it a three carbon chain, throw in all your hydrogens, and I want you to notice that the hydrogens on the terminal carbons, so we have the left side and the right side, those are our terminal carbons, one of them will have three hydrogens and all the other and it also has three hydrogens. Well those six hydrogens are equivalent to each other. If I were to put a chlorine on either the end, left end or right end, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if I put it on the left or right because once I put the chlorine on there I could flip it and it would look like the other side. But here's a difference here. Are you seeing this carbon in the middle here? This is actually different. These hydrogens are not the same as the hydrogens on the terminal N. So that means I'm actually going to get two organic products out of this. So let me show you what that means. All right, take a look at this. I haven't put the chlorines in yet, but we're going to have a situation where one reaction, the chlorine is going to go on an end carbon, and we're also going to get another product. We can't keep this from happening. We're going to get another product where it comes on the second carbon. Now the third one is the same as the first. We're only going to do these two. So the first product here, if I were to put a chlorine coming off of the first carbon, and the other time it's going to come off the second. This is a time where I actually get two organic products out of this that are separate from each other. So how do I know I get two products instead of one? You need to take a look at the model and determine if you have equivalent hydrogens or not. And again, we talked about that the terminal ones are the same as each other versus the middle that are they're actually different than the other. So let's take a look up here. The reason why we didn't have two products here, because on an ethane, all the hydrogens were equivalent. So the more carbons you get, the more products you're going to get. Now, here we have a situation where we've actually completed this reaction. It doesn't seem balanced. But... For organic chemists, there's some reactions we balance and some we don't. Combustion reactions, you have to balance. On this one, when you get more than one organic product, we don't have to balance it. So we don't have to put a two coefficient here. We don't have to put coefficients anywhere else. We do have to put the minor secondary product of HCl, but we only have to write it one time. All right, I wanted to show you the computerized version of the exact same reactions. On this one here, you can see I actually colorized the H and you can see where the Br went instead. And then also on this one, I put heat or light on here. Oh, also I need to mention, do you see the lambda here? Lambda is the same as H nu because lambda equals H nu. So yes, you can use H nu, you can use lambda, you can use the triangle. But you have to put at least one over the arrow. All right, back to this, we have this carbon and this carbon. These are different from each other. And did you see how I noted this instead of having the branch come down when I hand wrote it? Do you see how I have the CL coming off the last carbon here, which is carbon number one? And then I also have it inside of here. So there's a couple of ways you can represent the same product. So I mentioned before that only one halogen can go on at a time, and this is describing that for us. Halogenation of an alkane can only add one halogen at a time. If more than one halogen is required, then multiple reactions are needed. So take a look at this reaction. This is methane, and this is a chlorination reaction. Here's our H nu. And what's going to happen is we'll get the chlorine substituting for one hydrogen and get this minor secondary product. If I want more than one chlorine on here, then I'm going to have to take this product, and now it's going to become the reactant, and I can get a second chlorine on there. And then if I want a third, I have to do the reaction again, but with this, react, this product here now being my reactant, and so on. Moving on to cycloalkanes. They are unsaturated hydrocarbons. In fact, up here, if you take a look at the formula, it is different than the alkane formula because it, it is a different ratio. CNH2N, that is the formula for a cycloalkane. And because it isn't the same as the alkane, these are known as unsaturated. When you have a ring, that's actually going to cause a degree of unsaturation. Carbon atoms can form cyclic or ring compounds when there are three or more carbons. These compounds have the same number of carbons but two less hydrogens than the corresponding open chain alkane. Thus, they are not isomers with the linear or branched alkanes with the same number of carbons. Again, they don't have the same formula. Cyclopropane and cyclobutane are more reactive than the corresponding alkane 
This is due to the distortion of the bond angles and it's known as angle strain. If you remember, if the straight chain tetrahedral shape is 109.5 degree, well if you have a cyclopropane you have a 60 degree bond angle, that's pretty far from a 109.5. If I have a cyclobutane that's a 90 degree bond angle, again that's still pretty far off of the 109.5, so that strain causes the molecule to be quite reactive. You can see from the models of these compounds that the rings are fairly rigid. The carbon-carbon bonds cannot be rotated or, or even move relative to one another until you get to much larger rings consisting of five or more carbons. To represent cycloalkanes, there's a number of ways we can do it. The first way we can do it, if you take a look at cyclopropane, is we can take the number of carbons. In this case, it's three carbons, prop. A and E is telling me that they're single bonded and cyclo is telling me that my carbons are in a ring. So the first thing I would do is write my three carbons, attach them with single bonds, and then if I want to explicitly show all the hydrogens, I would go ahead and make sure all my hydrogens are radiating away from the ring. None of the hydrogens would be in a ring. Here's an example of cyclobutane. Four carbons in a row. Make sure that the carbons themselves are bonded together. And then you can see that each carbon, because it needs four bonds total, gets two hydrogens each. Here I have cyclopentane, and in this case I'm showing you this dashed wedge, solid wedge idea. The solid wedge means it's closer to you, and the dashed wedge means it's going away from you. That's a little bit different than the other two that I'm showing you here and here. And then on cyclohexane, I actually don't even show the hydrogens explicitly. I included them within the ring. So this would be an example of how you would include hydrogens in a ring. Notice the left-hand side has hydrogens on the left-hand side, and then we have them on the right-hand side here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do and show you is other ways we can still represent all of these compounds. So let's go back to cyclopropane. This is how you would represent it in the condensed structural formula. The one to the left is expanded. And this is the line structure. The line structure is probably the best structure for rings because anytime we have a bend or an end, we have a carbon there. So the line structure for cyclopropane is simply a triangle. Now you can use, I told you you can't use line structures earlier for linear or branched molecules, but you may use line structure for any ring at all from now on in the class. So if you needed to draw a cyclopropane, all you have to do is draw a triangle. Now it is up to you to remember that each carbon still has two hydrogens. So on the cyclobutane and cyclopentane, I'd like you to go ahead and pause the video. I'd like you to go ahead in the second box, write the condensed structural formula for it. And in the third box, I want you to go ahead and write the line structure for both cyclobutane and cyclopentane. Now in cyclohexane, I skipped the part where you're showing hydrogens ex explicitly. See how I have the condensed structural formula already? What I want you to do in cyclohexane in this box here is just go ahead and do the line structure. So go ahead and pause the video, come back and check your work. All right, take a look and see how you did. Make any modifications to your notes if you made any mistakes. And we will talk a little bit more about cycloalkanes. Properties of cycloalkanes. Now, the melting points are affected by the shapes of the molecules and the way the crystals pack so they don't change uniformly. So we don't have melting point increasing systematically. So that means we cannot predict just because a cycloalkane weighs more, we cannot predict if its melting point is going to increase. Take a look at melting point is in the darker color here and it's not systematic. But what we do have, what is systematic, is the boiling points do increase with molecular weight. You can see that the lighter color here. Nomenclature of ring compounds. For monosubstituted rings, name the substituent first, then the parent name. Don't forget cyclo, and write as one word. So here's my example here. We have a six-membered ring, all single bonded. That's where the cyclohexane came from. And coming off of the ring is a methyl group. Now we don't give the methyl group an address because I could have drawn this methyl group on any of the six corners. They would have been equivalent. Go ahead and build the model and convince yourself that a numbering system isn't required because it doesn't matter where it goes. And the reason for a numbering system or the address is for clarification. And when clarification isn't required, then you don't give the number. For polysubstituted rings, we use the IUPAC nomenclature. 
You number in the direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which gives the lowest composite number to the substituents. If there is a tie with a composite number, start with the substituent that has alphabetical priority, and that will be carbon number one. List substituents alphabetically, then the parent name, don't forget cyclo, and write as one word. For this slide, I want you to draw the following. Remember, writing out the structure is called drawing. So draw the following, and I want you to go ahead and pause the video and fill these in yourself based on the name. I want you to go ahead and get practice when we give you the name first to draw the structure, and then after this, we'll have structures and you get to generate the name. So go ahead and pause the video, do as many of these as you can, and come on back and we'll check your work. Looking at these structures, there is a possibility that yours looks slightly different than mine. Based on what you were calling carbon number one, and also if, for example, if you had a cyclohexane, did you choose to put the uh, top of it flat or did the top of it have the peak on it? So let's look at the basic pieces of this and see if you actually did get the right answer, but your answer looks slightly different than mine, but it's actually the same compound but rotated. So we needed to have cyclohexane. So I have six carbons, single bonded in a ring. One, two, three, four, five, six. On carbon number one and carbon number four, I have two methyl groups. So I went ahead and called this carbon number one. And when I went around the ring, I chose to go clockwise. This is carbon number four. Well, actually, technically, I could have gone counterclockwise, and that would also be four. And then remember, I could have also called this one carbon one and this one carbon four. So what you're looking for in your structure is you need to have a cyclohexane and across from each other would be two methyl groups. All right, this one is another cyclohexane. Coming off carbon number one is an ethyl and two is a methyl. So the way I have my compound drawn here, it is still correct because this could be carbon number one and going in this direction counterclockwise, this is carbon number two. 113 trifluoral cyclohexane. I do a lot of cyclohexanes because it's just the, one of the most common structures you get in organic chemistry, plus it's a little easier to draw. Notice here I have two fluoros on the same carbon, and carbon number three away from that is a single. Also, when you draw fluoro, make sure you don't do FL, that it's just F. On 1-ethyl-3,5-dimethyl cycloheptane. Drawing a seven-membered ring is not so easy, but I wanted you to get practice at that once. And then we have three different things coming off of this. And notice my ethyl here is carbon number one. And in this case, if I look at my structure and I go counterclockwise on carbon, this is carbon two, carbon three is a methyl. Oops, that's a three. And once you choose a direction, you have to maintain the direction for the whole molecule. This is carbon number five. One T-butyl three isopropyl cyclohexane. T-butyl, that's this group right here. That was one of the groups we were asked to learn earlier in the semester. Isopropyl, I'll go ahead and circle that one, is this one right here. Again, it's another group we were asked to memorize earlier in the semester. And this gives us an opportunity to see how these T-butyl and isopropyl could be used in naming. 1,1-dibromocyclopentene. All right, five carbons, all single bonded, and both of my bromos live on the same carbon. Draw the following. So again, I want you to go ahead and pause the video, fill in these structures, and then come back and check your work. 2-ethyl-1,1-dimethylcyclohexane. Here's my cyclohexane, here's my two methyls coming off the same carbon, and my ethyl coming off carbon number two. Now if you were to get this structure and ask to do the name, I want you to be very careful on your numbering system. I want you to notice that you physically have two things coming off of one carbon here. Did you notice that? I have a methyl group here. Sorry, methyl's not coming in so good and I have another methyl group here. Because I have two methyls, this becomes carbon number one. It's not the case of a tie. Remember, in the case of a tie, alphabetically, ethyl would come first. But this is not a tie. This is a one-one situation where I have something coming off of one and one, and then something coming off of two, and that would be going, let me get that in there better, that would be going in this direction. 
it's actually one one this is a physical thing and that's why I gave you this example I wanted you to go ahead and practice that one bromo three methyl cyclopentane bromo is one two three there's my methyl group two methyl propyl cyclopentane remember when we had a branch off of a branch well, let's take a look here we have this is my three carbons and coming off of my three carbons one this is carbon two this is carbon three that's where this propyl comes from and then we have coming off of that a two methyl group that's my two methyl group right here and that's why it's in parentheses because I have this coming off a of branch of a branch this group here also does not get a number in front of it because this could have come off of any of the five corners and be equivalent 135 tri iodo cycloheptane we have one two three four five so the numbering system is going in this direction again a lot of times my formatting will be different than yours but I want you to get used to seeing different formatting remember this is exactly the same as yours but most likely you had it going clockwise so I want you to get practice of seeing different formatting the other reason why I wanted to use iodide is because sometimes iodide when they put a capital I some of the fonts don't have that top and bottom piece to it and so it just looks like a random line so you need to get used to seeing iodide and this last one here looked pretty complicated in the name, but really it's not so bad. Just take it one piece at a time. Cyclohexane, so draw the parent first, six carbons, single bonded in a ring. And then start off putting bromo on one. Away from that four would be chloro. Go back and put an ethyl on two and a five on methyl. So as soon as you put the bromo on here, you've established where carbon number one's going to go. You can choose clockwise or counterclockwise, but once you choose a direction, you have to maintain the direction for the rest of the molecule. As I mentioned on the previous slide, I know I gave you the names and you were to draw the following. I would like you as practice to go ahead and draw the structures and regenerate the name. And what's neat is I've already got the names here for you. Don't forget to go ahead and work on some of the problems in your textbook and answers are in your solution guides. Definitely practice nomenclature. Naming cycloalkanes with branching. Well, we've already seen some branching. I'm talking about a different kind of branching. What if the branch coming off the ring is actually has more carbons than the ring itself. Let's take a look. You count the number of carbon atoms in the ring and the number in the largest substituent chain. If the number of carbons in the ring is greater than the number in the substituent, the compound is named as an alkyl substituted cycloalkane. Now I did cross out equal to or and in your lecture notes it's not going to be crossed out this is something during the video I just now noticed I'm going to answer that question equal to just beneath this so let's take a look at if the number of carbons on the side chain from the ring is larger in fact it won't even be a side chain let's take a look here in this case I have five carbons and a single carbon so which is bigger the five carbons or the one carbon the five carbons is bigger so that means that gets to be the parent cyclopentane Here's a situation where I have three carbons in a ring and four carbons in a chain. Which one's larger? Well, the four carbons is bigger, so it gets to be the parent. It's just a numbers game. Who is bigger? Actually, the ring and the chain are equivalent in priority. So size does matter. Whichever one's bigger wins. So the last name of this compound gets to be butane. And whenever you have a ring structure that does not have priority, we do that alkyl name where we put the YL ending on it. So this would be a 1-cyclopropyl butane. When you have a tie, and here I have five carbons in a ring and five carbons in a chain, I'm going to disagree with your textbook here. That's why I cross this out in your notes. Now this won't be crossed out in your lecture notes that you printed because I just noticed this as I was recording this. So if this is not crossed out, be sure to cross that out for me. So when there's a tie, the ring wins. So the name of this compound would be cyclopentane. And again, I just noticed another typo. You need to fix this. This actually has prop on here. It's supposed to be pent, so please fix that in your lecture notes. So the name of this compound would be one pentyl because I have one, two, three, four, five carbons, and it's connected to the end carbon, so that'd be one pentyl cyclopentane. Cis trans isomers in cycloalkanes. We don't have free rotation around a carbon-carbon bond when we have a cycloalkane, so it limits the structure. So we actually have two faces that the substituents can go on. 
I want you to go ahead now. I know the example on here has cyclopropane, but that's too small of a model a molecule for your model kit to handle. Why don't you go ahead and make either a cyclopentane or a cyclohexane so you can go ahead and kind of follow along with going, what's going on here. There are two different 1,2 dimethyl cyclopropane isomers. One, the two methyls are on the same side as the ring. So if we have a ring drawn here, and we can also have the model here, you can see that the CH3 group is on the same side of the ring, then that would be called cis. And in naming these, you would actually put cis in front of the entire name. Cis means same side. Cis tells us the geometry, so we need, when we put cis up here, we need to separate the letters and the numbers with a dash. We need to make sure that we also do that. But it goes right in front of it. So you would name the compound as you would normally name it. You have a 1,2 dimethyl cyclopropane, and then in front of it you would put the cis. Now the other face that can be shown, it says it has two faces, is one where we have the methyl groups on opposite side of the ring. So in this case they're trans to each other. And so you can see that I would have a 1,2 dimethyl cyclopropane. In fact both of these would have the exact same name if I didn't put cis or trans in front of it. Now this is the first time you've seen cis and trans. We're going to see cis and trans not only with cycloalkanes, but we're also going to see it when we have carbon-carbon double bonds. Now, right now, I've been highlighting where the methyl groups are relative to each other. So on the cis, we saw them on the same side. On the trans, we saw them diagonal to each other based on this uh, ring here itself. Well, here's something I want you to know is it's not actually the substituent that are cis and trans to each other it's technically hydrogens that are cis and trans and we're going to see that when we get to the alkenes so I probably if I were to um, make this this graphic myself I would have made the hydrogens in pink here and here and these hydrogens because it's really the hydrogens themselves that determine if you have cis or trans name the following cis and trans cycloalkanes so to do this, name, as, name them as though there were no cis and trans involved at all. And then after the fact, look at the hydrogens. How are they relative to each other? Are they on the same side? Then they'd be cis. If they are on opposite sides of the ring, then they would be trans. And put that in front of the name with a dash before the number. Go ahead and pause the video, draw the names, and come back and see how you did. Trans 1, 2, dimethyl cyclopentane. I have a methyl on 1, here's carbon 2, here's a methyl on 3. So I have a 1, 3, dimethyl cyclopentane, and my hydrogens, notice when I have a solid wedge that's coming at me, a dash wedge is going back, so this is indicating that this hydrogen is on the top side of this ring and this is behind the ring. So that would be trans to each other. Cis 1, 2, dichlorocyclohexane. This is another way to represent how we have cis and trans on rings and we can see that the dashed and solid wedge, so the solid wedge, the hydrogens are on the same side as each other, that would be cis. In this case, the solid wedge is coming at us, so that's the closest to it, but we can also see that the hydrogens are on the same side of the ring. That would make this cis 1,3 dimethyl cyclobutane. I picked this example because you don't always have to have the same thing. Notice this was dimethyl, dichloro, dimethyl. That just makes it easier to write the name. It, would, it just makes it shorter. But remember, it's the hydrogens themselves that cause it to be cis or trans, and that the substituents can be the same as each other or they can be different. So in this case, I have a bromo and I have an ethyl. They live on carbons 1 and 3, and because it's 1, Carbon 1 going from left to right or right to left, that's a tie. And whoever breaks the tie is alphabetical. That's why bromo gets to be number 1. So it's 1-bromo, 3-ethyl, cyclopentane. Now for the cis and trans part, notice I have the hydrogen on one side of the ring and then the other hydrogen where this is on the other side of the ring. And so that's going to be trans. Another thing I want to mention about cis and trans on a ring this example up here, the cis 1,2 dichlorocyclohexane, notice that the cis and trans are on adjacent carbons on carbon 1 and 2 versus this is on 1 and 3. So they don't have to be on a ring, they don't have to be on adjacent carbons either. They can be separated.
What we just introduced on cis and trans happens to be known as stereoisomers. So we started off this semester talking about constitutional isomers. Let's compare them now to stereoisomers. Constitutional isomers are when we have different connection between atoms. For example, we've seen this one quite a bit. We've seen butane in a straight chain, and we have also this methyl coming off of three. So these are constitutional isomers. They have the same molecular formula, but a different structure. What we just were introduced to are stereoisomers, and that's when we have the same connections, but in three-dimensional geometry, they're different, and that includes cis and trans. So these are both 1,2-dimethyl cyclopropane, 1,2-dimethyl cyclopropane, but what the difference is is the geometry. In this case, which one do I have, cis or trans? In this case I have cis, in this case I have trans. That's an example of a stereoisomer with cis and trans. Here's another one of those posters that I like to show you from compoundchem.com. Here are structural isomers, and we haven't gotten to double bonds yet, but this also kind of gives you an idea of that. And uh, keep in mind that the guy that writes this, he's actually from Great Britain, so they name, they name their double bonds slightly different than we will. So don't worry about the naming right here, where the this 2 and this 1 is in here. Just notice that the double bonds on carbon 2, starting on 2, and this one it's starting on 1. But the name itself, we'll definitely get into later on when we do double bonds in more detail. All right, so we have different kind of change isomers. We have functional isomers. Here we have geometric isomers, and then optical isomers. Optical isomers is something we will get to next semester, but at, and we'll be doing the double bonds very shortly. We do have the ring structure here, so you can see that one here. So go ahead and take a look at this and see if this helps you out a little bit in understanding a little bit more about isomers in organic chemistry.